we work to nurture the tourism industry in this country. Tourism promotion scenario is not very uh, encouraging because of the same very reason, because we don't have a United Boy. And we have now, Bata has proposed NICE, Nepal India China Expo, which is a way for all need to be aligned that I need to invest in the future of young people. Hello and welcome to Nepal Traveler Travel Trade Talk. This week, we are talking to a very interesting person who's from the hospitality industry, who runs a very famous hospitality school here. And he has been recently elected as the chairperson of Pata Nepal chapter. Mr. Kem Laki, welcome to Ashur. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, to begin with, now as the new uh, chairperson of Pata, what are your plans? What, what do you see as important that you'll be focusing on? Um, Nepalese tourism um, is definitely grappling with uh, the aftermath of COVID-19. We have yet to recover. And tourism has become a significant force for national economy, employment, um, foreign income, everything. It has a huge impact. So while we are recovering, and while the world slowly recovers, uh, we have so many, uh, so many ongoing issues that we need to address. Pata fortunately sits on the legacy of almost 50 years. Pata Nepal chapter was uh, established some 49 years ago by at that time a visionary uh, Prabhakar Samsev Rana. And it was further nurtured by so many leaders until now. And Pata has a very clear uh, mandate. Pata internationally works with the experts. Uh, Pata works together with the government, organizations, uh, NTOs. And uh, for that reason, and it's completely apolitical. That's a beautiful part, you know. And we, have, uh, we are connected, plugged into global expertise. That's what we need. Um, our immediate focus is on threefold. One is to make sure, put Nepal on the global map, that we are back and we have product to sell. For that, uh, we have different organizations in the country, be it uh, Hotel Association Nepal, different fraternity in travel and tourism, rafting, mountaineering, tour guide, so many associations. Unless and until we have a single voice, one voice, that we are a private sector and we work to nurture the tourism industry in this country, then our ability to negotiate with the government becomes thinner. Yeah. So number one, to have a united voice, understand our clear priorities, and be, be able to negotiate with our current government um, and be able to tell them what are the urgent tasks they need to do because um, without that tourism cannot, um, cannot grow. Having said that, we also have a huge uh, number of young people leaving the country. And you must be knowing that uh, the number of room almost doubled, doubled, you know, doubled. Everyone in the hope of uh, Visit Nepal 2020, 2020. which was uh, sabotaged by this global pandemic, right? Um, so um, that number of rooms people built has to be filled. And so that means we need tourists. The tourism promotion scenario is not very uh, encouraging because of the same very reason, because we don't have a united voice and frequent change of government uh, doesn't help much because somebody just begin to understand the priority and and then it's time for them to go. And not only the political change, 
that is normal, I guess. I mean, not normal, but we can bear with that. But we have a permanent government, let's say a secretary level. Even those secretary changes within the past uh, one and a half year, I, I think we've seen three secretary three changes. This is very dangerous for the country and for the tourism. So I think the permanent government, at least somebody who is capable, who is knowledgeable, who knows tourism, who knows tourism policy, should be stable. And then, you know, change of the government on all these things doesn't impact much. It impacts, but not so much, right? And so, um, what we can do, coming back to the same question, uh, the thing that we cannot change, we can only tell them, we can wish, we can educate, uh, we can do the advocacy, that's what we can do. But things that is under our control, um, human capital development, attracting young, young people to stay in a country is very important. That's our priority. Priority number two, we have a national um, uh, promotion campaigns, huge national uh, promotion campaigns. We concluded fourth uh, Himalayan Travel Mart, that is Nepal's pride brand, Nepal government showcasing Nepal. And when we say Himalayan Travel Mart, we don't just have Nepal. People travel now clubbing several Himalayan countries, be it India, be it Bhutan, and all this can be capitalized and Nepal is in the epicenter of the Himalaya. So this should be a pride event for everyone and this should be budgeted on time, and this should be taken as a pride, as a national event. Although we help initiate this, but this is an event of the nation. So similarly, other organizations have their own signature projects. They also have to do so. You know, and so, uh, first and foremost, uh, I would like to see the role of Tourism Board, which is our national tourism organization more prominent, more decisive, more visionary, and then we have a future. So these are our priorities at the moment. So on the first one, you spoke about uh, the associations, the private sector. Mm -hmm. We've had all these associations, we have them. There is a lot of uh, common ground. We have an understanding that yes, we can come up with some points for the government to focus as a priority. But how is the dialogue between these associations? And you as the chairman of PATA now, uh, would that increase? Would you see ways of getting all the presidents together to actually come to a common minimum program yes. that we will put to the government? Yeah, I mean, recently we, we attended one uh, budget program. Uh, that was a very good beginning of Nepal Tourism Board. They invited all the fraternities and if they could, um, uh, you know, suggest on what, where should the money of the Nepal Tourism Board go. Spend. Uh, for instance, we've given this um, in writing way ahead of time. That's what it is. So these are the programs we intend to do. Similarly, I assume that other organizations also have plan. It's not about whose plan is better. So if you say rafting, they know rafting business more than I do, right? Exactly. And it's rightfully so. And they should come up with their ideas. And uh, similarly, all the other fraternities. And um, we have a budget. Um, and then uh, that budget, we should uh, form a common consensus. Okay, these are our priorities, although not everything can be done. We have also our bottleneck, right? But uh, these are the national priority. Uh, these are the events we will do. And these are the events we'll do together. These are the events only Nepal Tourism Board will handle. And so once you have a blueprint, I would love to see a blueprint because uh, the nature of the budget, there are certain things that need to continuously go, go you know, uh, putting Nepal into digital map, for instance, it's not one year budget, you need to have a competent team, perhaps I would recommend that you have a globally competent, uh, you know, consultant, you know, right. because if you're selling globally, uh, creating a right narrative of this country is so Very important, important. because um, um, whenever we click one country, what comes first, we always know, is the negative. And then there was um, unfortunately a natural disaster and then two bus went on the river. But that will hit the news, first line all over the world. But what will not hit in the same speed is what Nepal has to offer. 
And Nepal fortunately ticks all the boxes. Travel and tourism industry in Nepal is not so new. It's well-rounded, well-grounded. Uh, and we have uh, spent centuries, almost, right? Almost. Yes. And so then uh, how do we capitalize? How do we tap into the young travelers? Uh, how do we understand our segment? Where do we need to focus? How do we uh, develop our destination? Not just stick to our traditional destination, uh, but the world needs somehow our uh, destination that are not well known. Of course, the uh, accessibility is a question, right? Uh, that is a separate issue that uh, we, uh, we can recommend, but uh, cannot do ourselves. Our, our other government mechanism has to do, but we can say these are important. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, we are also grappling with another issue, which is connectivity. Um, you must uh, realize that um, coming to Delhi and coming to Kathmandu almost costs double, right? So why would I travel Kathmandu if it costs double? And how do we reduce those fare? Because every traveler will check the pocket, you know. And so, uh, and that requires. Uh, the activation of our two brand new airport, which requires, of course, uh, tri-national uh, diplomatic, uh, diplomatic solution. Uh, and then we have now, Pata has proposed NICE, Nepal, India, China Expo, which is a way forward because uh, nothing like private sector's initiative push, push such a agenda. Please, because politics at the end of the day is politics, right? Everybody uh, wants their own share of benefit and that's normal i think so if a private uh, and business uh, interest comes into forefront that's and better. those gradually moves thing forward in my hope uh, that's what we should aim so this tri nation tri nation uh, mechanism on promoting travel and tourism because we're very fortunate we are sitting right in the center of almost 40% of the world population. population. Which country has this benefit? We are extremely fortunate, but we need to have our own uh, sets of, we need to outsmart in terms of understanding what's our national need, you know, what's our, uh, what's the narrative we want to promote in the world. And in terms of travel tourism, uh, I, I firmly believe that we have a very good foundation. Let me put it that way. Talking about the National Tourism Organization, NTB, right. which at the moment it doesn't have its uh, CEO, uh, that process has gone into legal issues. Uh, how confident are you that uh, our marketing, our promotions are not being affected at this moment because we seem to be in status quo and that happens on a regular basis again? I mean, you brought a very, <laughs> uh, very, you know, well-known pinpoint, I must say. The challenge with a country like Nepal, um, we are a democratic country. We have a constitution. And um, every time whenever, you know, such organizations like na National Tourism Organization, every political parties, once they stake, you know, so um, I, I wouldn't say that's only Nepal. I mean, it's rightfully so. People will nominate somebody who will better represent their voice or interest. That's normal. Um, but sadly, I must say, the people who are nominated for such an important position, first of all, should understand this business, how this works, and uh, they need to make decisions. If you ask me one question, what leaders do? The only job they have is to make decisions and to in, inspire others to make decisions. And create right? more leaders. Create a conducive environment for this industry to flourish. That should be our common goal, end of the story. But then here we spare a lot of energy and time, um, you know, poking each other uh, and wasting time on who is better and who is more stronger. Uh, I don't think that's a 2024 wisdom. When, where we stand today in the world, uh, we should have a culture of collaboration, uh, culture understanding common ground, understanding shared dream, and the beautiful 
future of this country should be the driving force, you know. And so we haven't been there yet for different reasons. But then, you know, I still believe that um, the solution is a stronger, functional Nepal tourism board. There's no, unless we can create, there are different examples in the other countries. Yes. And one of the examples I would like to share, create a tourism development council, a strong field with, um, you know, experts okay. whose job is just to get, the, get things done. They are expert, they are mandate, they have objective. Five years, nobody touched, but they, they create a mechanism, research-based, evidence-based, and then with the international expertise linking this. This is the kind of thing we need. I'm not saying that Nepal Tourism Board cannot do that. They are structured. There is no problem in how they, this was structured. But the problem is uh, uh, how does it function? function. The functionality is, um, uh, I clearly see a divide. I mean, if you see last year's figure, and if you're spending 17, 18% on a budget, we should all be ashamed when this is a need, uh, where this we should be promoting. Exactly, and that's where I started. Rest of the countries, rest of the countries are Competing coming out. They're promoting there them. are countries uh, who, are, uh, who are suffering from over-tourism. Forget yes, about backlash. recovery. They're like uh, worried about over-tourism, right? and where we are not even spending. And that very traditional approach of, okay, I decide to sabotage your plan because I'm bigger, should, should be out of this question. So whoever has that kind of ego or you know, understanding that I'm the powerful person, and I spin the world, uh, you know, that oh, should true. be identified and, and combated and educated and once again, from the private sector. And with due respect, everybody has contributed. This is an industry where um, even the normal citizen has to be educated. Like I can give you an example. Sometimes I was in, I was in Joomla uh, on my road trip and trekking. And one person said, we're pretty happy with um, Nepali tourists because they spend, they spend more. more money and eating and you know, they just want uh, room cheaper, but this and that. And then I said, did somebody tell you that, okay, if my money goes into your pocket or your money comes to my pocket, it's okay. That uh, propels the economy. But our nation becomes stronger when the external money comes to this country. Foreign exchange, exactly. Yeah. Tourism and, and, and in terms of tourism, I don't think people have educated the impact. You know, the tourism has so many benefits. You're branding your nation, you're bringing the foreign currency, uh, or even a tourist who comes into this country, propels the whole economy, economy yeah. creates job, the transportation has job, the tour guide has job, the lodge and hotel, tea house has a job, you know, vendors, it has got everything. multiple exactly. impact, right? And this person, for a reason, goes back and promotes within his one or one circle that how wonderful vacation they have and it creates more demand and we're very fortunate. So our job basically is to make sure that uh, whoever comes are welcome um, in a fundamental level. We Nepalese have already inherited very rich hospitality heritage. This just need to be torn into a pride. You know, that's all I think uh, is needed in this country. Yes. So going on another tangent yes. and you are from that background. You run one of the best, uh, most uh, well-known, renowned uh, hospitality schools. Uh, how did that start? How did you get involved in the hospitality education? And because that's going to play a big role. Absolutely. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, from the age of 18, all my life, uh, I've been in uh, hospitality. I started my career with uh, Sulti Oberoi at that time. I was the first batch apprentice and then was offered a job, right? And then as time goes by, um, I attended um, Swiss hospitality education, worked in several countries, uh, put a little bit of education from Canada, a little bit of education from Australia. You know, you keep learning. And one fine day, um, I just realized that, um, okay, I'm fortunate enough that I know the world, I know a little bit about hospitality, 
industry and um, that was the time year 2003 when country was uh, really really in a very sad state very unstable the civil war was almost at the end and um, the young people were very desperate and then um, i was in my one of those traveling leg in uh, middle east in bahrain to be precise and to meeting young people who could have had a much better career and job was a eye opener for me that uh, this is what i should be doing you know and so 2007 uh, now it's been 18 years and now we're together with um, uh, switzerland so my own education in switzerland was the link common link and then gradually we added to the merit because uh, vocational education is equally important not everybody will go for bachelor's degree master's okay. degree and they don't have to because in this country uh, we did not value much on skill and competencies and you don't need to spend four years six years degrees that's that's another cup of tea but young people today needs world class training and job dignified job and opportunity to grow and that's what we did best i believe so until now we have a campus in bokra we have a campus here in kathmandu and more than 9000 people have attended in this 18 years so it's exciting so we're only warming up and i think you're right because um um the human capital and particularly now we are a young nation and this demographic dividend is not going to stay forever like this we have this window of next 15 20 years and if we do not uh, train and if you do not make sure that these young people have a meaningful engagement and the country will lose so i'm a little bit concerned because um i do not see um uh, the this this as a as an opportunity and enough priority given to this sure. topic so if uh, we are only talking about our uh, young people leaving because they do leave i mean at certain point we are not only exception young people also want to see the world they know what it is but and they also want to come back now you know and it's our responsibility to create a conducive environment for them you know for them uh, uh and and that's our immediate priority and so probably if somebody is coming back having four years of fantastic cooking experience and we know i mean how do we tap this how do we make sure that this person is not frustrated and looking for another option and whereas you can clearly ask anybody they are also challenged by not having a competent human capital one way there are flux of people trained experienced people returning back to the country but on the other hand we did not create a conducive environment or a clear road map where they could work where they could give their energy you know and those are the things we need to really address Imagine. how would you address this because most of the hoteliers the hospitality gms who sit in similar talks always yes. say we can't get people to work in our hotels uh, and then we have people in, in in a broad sense people are leaving the country yes yeah. they get that exposure but then how do we attract them back after a few years this is a very interesting question thank you because uh, you know our model of education has always been challenging uh, we we didn't evolve much and let's say if um, somebody comes to our college and they spend 10000 dollar approximately and uh, if they are coming from outside the valley and if they spend another couple thousand on living uh, for mid class upper mid class there's an urgency of recovering that, that money, money nobody is sitting with some, most, know, of not, most of them most of them do not have that reserve and there's no mechanism for a country to to fund education for young people right exactly. it's very simple so then um we um understood this challenge and we co-created with Kathmandu University i would like to really thank Kathmandu University they come up with a degree awarding apprenticeship we call it bachelor's in professional hospitality which is a four years degree but uh, students can come six months they get familiar another six months once they have the foundation they can work and study, study at the same time so they can support themselves and in this journey by the time 4 years we are com- completing one loop 
they all are set industry you ready you don't need to they are ready. industry ready and uh, and the industry don't have to complain they just have to pay means uh, we have to see this a uh, little bit of expenses as an investment if you make a fancy building spend 10 million us dollar would you not spend friction of you know 2% on human capital i think we have that moral right because that's what propels because to be honest uh, how do you differ the room from Hilton to Marriott to Hyatt or Sulti or so? Room is room. Pretty <coughs> much standard, right? You have a bed seat, clean bed seat, good toilet, good view, whatever. But then what makes the difference is the service, that impeccable, uh, you know, bespoke it's service. People. Who exactly. creates that? People. It's the people. And so I think our Nepalese uh, employers, be general manager, professional, all need to be aligned that I need to invest in the future of young people. But having said that, I'm not talking about a Dubai salary to start with. But you can pay a basic salary to start, you know, because they will do the equal job, if not better, right? And yes, so that's sir, the problem. <laughs> I have talked to many young students who are studying in hospitality management mm -hmm. or just studying to be a barista because right, they come right, from right. lower income families. Yes, that's yes. what they can afford. And most of them tell us that I have to go abroad because I don't get paid enough or even when I go for internship, they expect me to do it for free. Is that a problem in Nepal? And then we complain that, that we don't huge, have people. That was a huge problem. I mean, I would not uh, be polite on that. Uh, I mean, it's kind of exploitation. I must say that. I mean, if young people, I, I work for 10 hours, 12 hours, and uh, I even need to pay is a pure exploitation. That's There's no question about it. There's no better word of that, Excellent. right? But then, okay, how do you start? Fine, uh, you start paying this person uh, maybe pocket money Stipend. for a transportation or something to start with, but give them a milestone. What do I have to do? What does the good work look like? When do I get paid uh, my basic salaries? These are the indicators, right? When you do this, and this is what you will pay. And so they constantly are challenged because this, this millennials, now Gen Z we call it, they have a very different characteristics. They are driven by challenge. You just need to communicate that and trust in them that you can do that, you know. And, and, um, and a lot of time we have, um, the, I'm sorry to use this term, but the old school. The, oh, I have gone through this path and you yes, also exactly. have to go through. You don't have to. We're living in a different era. Exactly. The people have to be motivated. The young people have to be given challenge to be guided and they will figure out. Exactly. They're much more effective. They're much more, um, uh, you know, well informed. And so we need to capitalize. Exactly. And, and not, not that only my time, I used to work 18 hours. So you need to do that. You don't have to do that. That doesn't work anymore. And the same young people <laughs> yes. are working abroad and bring excellent jobs. I was in Malaysia in December. Right. Almost every staff there was a young uh, Nepali. And they were getting paid. They were studying. They were doing on job. That's correct. And they That's don't correct. want to do it in Nepal. So this yes, is the yes. problem. Yes. Um, um, another thing is, um, I mean, you brought a very good uh, topic. One thing is, of, of course, the dignity of labor. This country never evolved from one point that, okay, um, I'm, I don't feel comfortable to call myself a cook or a Waiter. wedding staff or bartender and so on and so forth. That's not true. Worldwide, every job is dignified. Every, every job is important. And our audience, the service receiver, also has to be educated that if you go to a nice restaurant and a, a young boy or girl brings food and uh, smiles at you, and uh, we don't appreciate enough. We think that now I have become a big person because I'm paying the money. No, somebody doing something for you, you know, we genuinely need to appreciate. If it is good food, it's a good food, good service, thank you very much, well done. That's all they need. And so that that has to also be changed. So I think uh, you cannot just complain about people living abroad. Apart from mm. educating the yes. young yes. students, we also need to educate the general public. The general population. public, absolutely. You, you know, those days are gone. Like, hey, I need this, right? Because I'm paying now. No, if somebody is doing this and it's equally respectful, and it's it's like this rich Carlton philosophy. A ladies and gentlemen serving to the ladies and gentlemen. So our dignity is equal. Maybe I'm doing this job, but 
Uh, it doesn't mean that I'm less than you. And that pride, once you instill, you see that people will retain here. Also in Nepal, at the moment, there are a number of hospitality uh, colleges or educational institutes relating to tourism and such training. Uh, how do you see that? Is that a mushrooming or is that really helping the, the hospitality industry, the economy of Nepal? Um, there are two aspects of it. One thing, any business in this country, um, uh, because if somebody is doing well, other person will jump, jump in, in without much investigation, without much research. So as a result, so many people jump in, it must be good. And um, not only hospitality college, but anything, if you want to do a good job, you need to know what this is. You need to be educated. You need to be passionate. You need to know inside and out about this. And there are a number of uh, amazing institutions in, the, in this country who are doing very well. And there are others who just came by fluke because it looks like uh, it's a good business. And competition is not necessarily bad because it pushes me to do better, right? Exactly. And, and so I'm not so much afraid of uh, you know, new coming in the town, but I'm worried about our mechanism, our country mechanism. How do you monitor how do you ensure that uh, the students are not, um, you know, mm -hmm. not just going to the school and um, learning nothing and are not competent enough to go to the industry? That's my worry. But that, uh, that's a government mechanism that has to look after that uh, aspect. Otherwise, competition is good. If I, if I do well, and uh, how do you ensure that I do well? If my students do well. That's an indicator, that's right? Easy. And so um, eventually, uh, I'm pretty sure that government is also now coming close and close uh, into monitoring such things. But one thing I must say, when we say colleges, uh, uh, we must not forget that uh, bachelors, bachelors, masters, that's not only education. What I want to see is this, uh, although there's national vocational qualification system and all the political parties are very clear that, okay, technical vocational school is very important, important. so and so forth. But, but we are far behind. How do, we, how do we attract people? How do we create pathways? How do we create permeability? How do we create a mechanism where somebody is cooking for seven years he didn't go to, or she didn't go to any school. Uh, there's something called recognition of prior learning. This person is not going to go, and it's not necessary right. another four years. Uh, to get a degree degree. No. Recognize officially what this person already knows and built on that so that they also get certified and they also move on. Those are the system. Uh, it's in discussion. Expert says it's important, but we need to really come down, sit on the table and structure does it have to be perfect? No. Every country, they evolve. They tried, they failed, they evolved, and they succeeded, and then that's where they come. And we will also have our own learning curve. So we shouldn't be shy away. Anything that we try to do new thing, uh, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be done. And the first step has exactly. to be moved forward. So this country, in my opinion, in nutshell, nutshell, is not structured in such a way that let's do it, let's move forward. And if there's a problem, we'll, we'll address it and we'll move forward. But the mindset is like, you're in the business, you're going to cheat for sure. So how can I make sure that you don't function? You know, that's how, no, it should be the other way around. Well, you seem to know, I mean, of course, you need to know who is doing the business, whether you have the basics or not. But once you're licensed, let this person flourish a little bit and, and monitor closely and then uh, let them have their own uh, you know, learning curve and then have a very clear boundary what they can do and what they cannot do. And then everybody grows. And this country deserves that everybody, everyone grows, you know, not that, uh, you know, the controlling and uh, not letting you uh, move a step forward. You know, that's what I believe. So as a final question, what would you say uh, all the associations, the NTO, the government should be working on at this moment to really improve tourism? I'm mean, not talking a lot of things, but one, two, what are the most yes. important things right now? Um, um, because uh, we're not uh, different from, uh, you know, the 
Nepal cannot function on its own. We're very much impacted by global tourism uh, and um, we have different organizations. Um, I cannot say enough about what are the pinpoint of uh, trekking agencies, what are the pinpoint of uh, uh, you know rafting agencies. They have heaps of problem. This should also come forth and we have created a now a forum so that everything that helps tourism should come forward and we should have one voice to come to the government and negotiate this is what we need. So that's number one. Number two, everybody who travels today, number one fear is safety. Safety, be it red safe, uh, road safety, be it aviation safety. safety and so on and so forth. So with whatever has been learned, uh, we shouldn't uh, um, take it lightly. So those safety has to be num number one priority in every aspect, uh, mountaineering or be it anything. The third thing is biohazard is another thing, you know, but we need to make sure that um, we cannot say that Nepal is like this. Um, whether you have your meal in a highway or in a five-star hotel or in a tea house, it has to be safe, fit for consumption. Nepal can do that. I think Kathmandu municipality already started and I'm pretty sure that this will, this will have a ripple effect. So my optimism is that um, that has to be sure. And um, uh, if Nepalese tourism industry has to foster, uh, uh, grow, um, the, the, uh, the link, the accessible, um, affordable um, uh, you know, connection is the most important question. And for that, um, I already mentioned that um, this tri-national uh, mechanism to address this, to make sure that uh, we have um, flights, um, and then um, at the same time, um, the, sometimes we, we hear a lot of those uh, concern about uh, European Union putting Nepal, uh, Nepal in the blacklist. So I think this should be our number one goal. And that's not you and me. It's there are international experts who negotiate, who assess, who consult. And Nepal Airlines, Nepal government or CAN, uh, whoever is the right authority, should immediately um, appoint such people. group of people, independent uh, lawyer, negotiator, so that we are off the list. Okay, this is our mission. Within a year, uh, Nep Nepalese Airlines, this EU blacklist is lifted. Look at that, how beautiful news, right? And uh, those will have a far-placed impact on tourism, tourism yeah. in the country. And that's not only for tourists. For you and I as a citizen also need to Feel, feel safe, safe exactly. if we are flying, right? That's that. And um, another most important thing, uh, the policy bottleneck, Tourism Act has not been reviewed. Many, many people are asking now for uh, tourism to be recognized as industry. industry. That's our need. Uh, because then entrepreneur, business people have uh, access to loan, access to finance in a subsidized rate, because if this is doing good to the country, they are, they support, they are supposed to be supported, right? Exactly. And so that, that is um, another issue. And uh, the promotion budget, if, I mean, I do not uh, hear anything, any political parties or anybody saying tourism is not important, they say, but it's time now they do. And doing means you need to put uh, sufficient budget and a mechanism whereby if you allocate the budget, of course you it will, has to be used. Um, if this is taxpayers' money, every penny has to be, uh, I mean, the accountability has to be there. But nobody has a right to sabotage and because indecision is equally a crime. Exactly. In a context of a Nep uh, country like Nepal, if tourism is not growing, it impacts hugely. So, um, Indecision is also another form of corruption, I must say. I'm not exactly. afraid to say that. It know, is, it's it not is. only taking bribe. Exactly. Because if you are in a position to make decisions, if you are not making decisions, I think uh, those play, plays, whoever comes into the, uh, the office and authorities, they have to be closely monitored for their performance. Not that once I sit on the table, so, you know, um, so they need to get off their horse and do the doings. That's what I believe. <laughs> well, we hope all these things will happen, Tim, sir. Thank you so much for taking the time and joining us. It's such a pleasure. Such a, such a pleasure being here. Thank you so much. Thank you.